Today what we're going to look at is chapter 10 of the David Myers AP Psychology textbook, Thinking in Language. This is the 8th edition of the textbook. So again, we're just going to look at an overview of thinking in language. So thinking or cognition refers to a process that involves knowing, understanding, remembering, and communicating. So when we look at cognitive psychologists, what they look at is they look at concepts, problem solving, decision making, and judgment formation. So concepts are just a mental grouping of similar objects, events, ideas, or people. And there are a variety of chairs, like we have all kinds of chairs, but their common feature is that they are the concept of chairs. So you can have a chair that is plush, you can have a chair that's just like a student chair. You can have all kinds of different chairs, but they're still a chair. So we look at concept hierarchies. We organize concepts into um, category hierarchy. So when we look at animal, we can look at domesticated, something that sits in our home, and then we can look at wild, which you know uh, Miss Davis avoids. So now when we look at domestic, we look at cows and cats. Obviously cows don't come in the house. And then we look at dogs. So dogs do come in the house, and we have different kinds of dogs here. So development of concepts. We form some concepts with definitions. For example, a triangle has three sides. Mostly we form concepts with mental images, our typical examples like these prototypes. So you remember prototypes when we looked at um, like Piaget with his um, concepts and how children develop their learning. So for example, a robin is a prototype of a bird, but a penguin's not. Right? Because what can a robin do that a penguin can't do? Okay. So categories. Once we place an item in the category, our memory shifts towards the category prototype. So a prototype is just like our best example kind of thing. So a computer generated face that was 70% Caucasian led people to identify the person as a Caucasian. So a problem solving, we look at algorithms. And so algorithms are logical rules or procedures that guarantee a solution to a particular problem. So when we look here, um, algorithms, because they guarantee a solution to the problem um, and you are exhausting all possibilities, it can be very time consuming. So computers use algorithms. So here's a word that um, is scrambled. Can you figure out what the word means or what the word is? So when we look at heuristics, heuristics are simple thinking strategies that allow us to make judgments and solve problems efficiently. So heuristics are less time consuming, but they are more error prone than our algorithms. So heuristics, it make it easier for us to use simple like pr principles or simple solutions to find a problem. So here we go, if we put a Y at the end and if we see if the word makes sense, okay, okay we can keep moving. Alright, so the word obviously is psychology. Now, why um, you put that Y at the end, you start rearranging the letters, and see you came up with a solution, but that's a heurith, uh, heuristic. And when we look at algorithms, it's a little bit different. Now, um, when we look at chimpanzees and we look at insight, insight just basically is a sudden novel realization of a solution to a problem. And humans and animals have insight. So you can figure out how to get to something or how to do something suddenly. It's like that light bulb up inside your head. So insight, brain imaging and EEG studies suggest that when an insight strikes that aha moment, it activates the right temporal cortex. And the time between not knowing and the solution is actually about 0.3 seconds. So people, the insight is pretty quick to how to solve the problem. Now we do have some obstacles that occur in us solving problems like confirmation bias, a tendency to search for information that confirms your personal bias. So if I believe that vitamins can cure me of the common cold, I'm going to find all kinds of research studies that suggest that and then I'm going to confirm my personal bias to it. So two, four, six. So rule, any ascending series of number one, two, three would comply. So SS had difficulty figuring out the rule due to a confirmation bias. So when we look at fixation, it's an inability to see a problem from a fresh perspective. This impedes uh, problem solving, and two examples of fixation are mental set and functional fixedness. So like if you look at this matchstick, this is a matchstick problem. How would you arrange six matches to form four equilateral triangles? So try and figure it out. So using these materials now, how would you mount the candle on a bulletin board? Here's how you actually solve the matchstick problem. You've got it. Now here's how you solve the candlestick problem. 
Mental set is the tendency to approach a problem in a particular way, especially if that way has actually been successful in the past. So when an earring drops in the morning and I can't see, I get a flashlight, or what I can do is I can get my cell phone and use it as my flashlight. Because in the past, my cell phone has worked fine as a flashlight. I use my cell phone as my little flashlight to find my earring that now has dropped underneath my bureau. Now, functional fixedness. This is a tendency to think only of a familiar function of an object. Like, instead of thinking of my cell phone as a flashlight, I only think of my cell phone as a actual phone. I don't think of it as anything else. That's the functional fixedness. So it's your inability to think of something outside the box. So problem. Tie the two ropes together and use a screwdriver, cotton balls, and a matchbox. So how you'd actually solve this is using the screwdriver as a weight, tie it to the end of one rope, swing it towards the other rope, and tie the knot. Now there's two kinds of heuristics. We have representative heuristics and availability heuristics. And so when we look at these two things, we're going to look at representative heuristic first. So judging the likelihood of things or objects in terms of how well they might seem to represent or match a particular prototype we have. So if you look at this example, if you meet a slim short man who wears glasses and likes poetry, what do you think his profession would be? Ivy League professor or truck driver? Which do you think? Most of you have probably said Ivy League professor. But when you really look at it, there's a greater probability that the guy's a truck driver, but just for the simple fact that there are more truck drivers than there are Ivy League professors. So this is that representative heuristics. When I think of a person who likes poetry and a short, slim, wears glasses, I think of somebody who is probably like an Ivy League professor versus someone who might be a truck driver. So the representative heuristic, the prototype, came to me that people who are short, like poetry, tend to be professors. So availability heuristic. Why does our availability heuristic lead us astray? So whatever increases the ease of retrieving information increases its perceived availability. So how is retrieval facilitated? So how recently we have heard about the event, that's like when you go, oh, I just heard about that, Miss Davis. That's kind of what you're talking about, how distinct it is and how correct it is. So these things help retrieve information for us. So making decisions and forming judgments. Each day we make hundreds of judgments and decisions based on our intuition, our gut feeling, seldom using any systematic reasoning. We just go with our gut. Overconfidence. Sometimes what happens is we actually overestimate our ability to do something. And we overestimate our ability to do something or the accuracy of our beliefs and judgment thanks to overconfidence. So at a stock market, both the seller and the buyer may be confident about their decisions on a stock. You're overconfident. You think there's no way this stock isn't going to make money. But then we do have exaggerated fear, though. So you got confidence, and then on the other spectrum, you actually have exaggerated fear. And exaggerated fear is not really founded on anything. It's just you're just scared. So after 9-11, the airline industry really suffered thanks to the attacks that were done. So what we saw was that a lot of people didn't fly right after 9-11. People were canceling their flights out of exaggerated fear. Framing decisions. Decisions and judgments may be significantly affected depending upon how an issue is framed. So when you look at this, it's like word effect, framing decisions. What is the best way to market ground beef? Is 25% fat or 75% lean? Which would you buy? Most of you would probably buy the 75% lean, which is exactly why the grocery stores label it as such. So when we look at belief bias, the tendency of one's pre-existing beliefs to distort logical reasoning by making invalid conclusions. So God is love, love is blind, Ray Charles is blind, Ray Charles is God. And this is just some anonymous graffiti that happens. But this is a belief bias. You've distorted reality because of some pre-existing belief that you have. So belief preservation. Belief preservation is the tendency to cling to our beliefs in the face of contrary evidence. No matter what you show someone, when they want to preserve their belief, they will stay to it. So you can show them like medical studies and all this other stuff. They don't care. Their belief is what they're actually going to preserve. So if you see that a country is hostile, you are likely to interpret any ambiguous action as a, as a sign of hostility. And it's just because you already believe that, and you're going to hold, you're going to cling to your belief no matter what. Here you go with powers of intuition and peril. So intuition may be perilous if unchecked, but it may also be extremely effective. And when you look at these things like 
blind, um, blind sight, hindsight bias, these kind of things. Just go over this real quick. It's just mainly definitions. So language is the next part that we look at with this unit. So language or spoken, written, or gestured work is the way we communicate meaning to ourselves and others. And language helps us transmit culture. Phonemes is the smallest distinct sound used in a spoken language. For example, like uh, when you look at bat, ba -a -a, okay, there you go. And then we look at chat. Right? So those of you that were hooked on phonics, here's how you learned it. The smallest distinct sound unit in a spoken language. Then we have morphine, and this is the smallest unit that carries a meaning. So it's like a small part of the word. And you can break words down this way and learn how to spell them. So milk, pumpkin, unforgettable. When we look at structuring of language, we look at basic sounds, we look at morphemes, we look at our meaning, we look at words, so we look at phonetics, morphemes, words, the meaning units. We look at phrases, putting the words together, and then we start building sentences. So putting all these big words together to make one nice big sentence. So grammar. Grammar is the system of rules in a language that enable us to communicate with and understand others. So when we look at grammar, we look at semantics and syntax. So semantic is the set of rules by which we derive meaning from our morphemes, our words, and our senses. So when we look at semantic rules, they tell us like adding ed to a word means that it occurred in the past. So you laughed, which means you laughed like last week or yesterday or in the last class period. Syntax consists of the rules for combining words into grammatically sensible sentences. So, for example, in English, there's a semantic rule that says that adjectives come before nouns. So, White House. Now, when you guys are studying Spanish, this messes you up all the time because in Spanish, it's actually reversed. So, in Spanish, instead of saying White House, you'd actually say house that's white, so Casablanca. And that's about all the Spanish I remember. So, language development. Children learn that their native language a lot before the age of two. Okay. Um, children are learning and picking up all kinds of stuff. And so really, um, when you're learning language, we're learning a lot of words every single year, which is why it's important for you to talk to your kids. So kids learn language before they do all these other things like with math and everything else. So picking up language is important. And they, kids' minds are like sponges and they just keep acquiring more and more. So when you look at babbling stage, beginning at about four months, kids are going to start making these weird little ah ah goo goo sounds. Babbling is not them imitating adult speech at all. So one word stage <clears throat> is about the first year, and normally about the kid's first birthday, they should be starting to speak one word. You know, it would be mommy, daddy, and that one word carries a lot of meaning. And like when they say doggy, it probably is telling you, mommy, hey, look at that cute doggy out there. Now, two word is normally about the second year of a child's life, and they start putting two words together, which we also call telegraphic speech. So, go car. I would like to go for a ride in the car. Mommy, please let me go. Now, you're supposed to get that from that go car. So, when they start hitting two, it's like they pick up on everything. So longer phrases really start normally around the age of three where they're starting to put three, four, five words together. And so mommy get ball. And there is some sense of semantics here. And there's some syntax in it. They don't get everything, um, but they do actually start getting humor in their language. So you never starve in the desert because of all the sand which is there. Huh? The kids we get it. All right, so when we learn language, uh, and here's just a nice little quick chart. So uh, Skinner also looks at language, so our learning guy. So Skinner did operant conditioning, so he looks at operant learning. So Skinner believed that language development may be explained on the basis of learning principles such as association, imitation, so they imitate us, and reinforcement. So um, we praise them when they start speaking. Um, they start associating speak with praise and all this other stuff, and really kids copy us. So inborn universal grammar is by Kromsky, and so what he does is he says Skinner's wrong. He suggested that the rate of language acquisition is so fast that it cannot be explained through learning principles. So most of the language is actually inborn. It's within you. And so he doesn't agree with Skinner's um, reinforcement schedule. Kromsky actually thinks the language is within you. So statistical learning and critical periods. So this is another theory that looks at our language. And well before our first birthdays, our brains are discerning words, breaking down them statistically in the syllables that we can understand.